Hello and welcome to Hash Outbound. I will be your host tonight, Michelle Haddad. So tonight's topic is going to be the government's role in education and the education system. So without further ado, let me introduce our first contestant. New to the show, Seth Morrison is currently a senior attending Cal State Fullerton, majoring in political science and minoring in international politics. He's a firm believer in the Constitution and the restraints on government found within it. So his passion for limited government and fiscal responsibility has led him to founding the Cal State Fullerton College Republicans. His first exposure to working in politics was during the 2012 election, where he interned for the campaign to re-elect Assemblyman Chris Norby. He has since interned for Congressman Daryl Issa, Supervisor Todd Spitzer, and has most recently been hired on full-time for the Lincoln Club of Orange County. Seth believes that government indeed has a role in our society and one that is limited and protects the rights and freedoms of its citizens. So he hopes to continuing the advance and the cause of liberty and limited government throughout his professional career. Seth believes that government has a role to play in our society, one that is limited in scope while protecting the rights and freedoms of its citizens. So his opponent, returning to the show for the second time, Eric Hennigan, the self-appointed admiral, came into anarchism via a circuitous route. He first navigated the shoals of selfishness espoused by Rand. After that, he radicalized under the writings of Rothbard, formalized arguments reading Friedman, and cultivated attitudes from Tom Woods and Jeffrey Tucker. All his thoughts about social order stems from a strict adherence to the non-aggressive principle. So thanks to the lower barrier of entry into online authorship, he now espouses to the virtues and a voluntary interaction of his blog at admiralanikbar.blogspot.com. And you guys can find that link in the event page on Google Hangouts. So I'm going to go over the structure. Each contestant is going to have four five-minute rounds with the other muted with a one-minute break in between. After that, we're going to have an open mic session between the two so they can speak openly, followed by another 10-minute Q&A from the audience. And I, the moderator, will be picking out the questions from the audience, which you can leave on the Google Hangouts page. So I'll be checking them pre periodically throughout the round. In between, we'll have a mes special message from different upcoming companies and our sponsors. And without further ado, up first is Seth Morrison. And Seth, I'll let you know when you're up. And Seth, you are on. Well, thank you, Michelle, for having me on. I just wanted to start off by saying that I'm a firm believer in limited government and the cause of liberty. Um, in regards to education, I wanted to make three points. First, market failure is the success. Second, market solutions are the answer. And third, that it's ultimately the reformation of our education system that will lead to the advance of liberty that we're, we're seeking to um, actualize. In regards to market failures, uh, as defined by Wikipedia, uh, it's when the allocation of goods and services by a free market is not efficient. That is, there exists another conceivable outcome where a market participant may be better off without making someone else worse off. Market failures can be viewed as scenarios where individuals' pursuit of self-interest leads to the result they're not efficient and cannot be improved upon from the societal point of view. So there's a couple examples of this regarding to education. One of them is, is that in order to exercise one's liberty, uh, a, basic, a basis of education and understanding is needed. I believe uh, Milton Friedman uh, wrote about this extensively, and that uh, an anarchical system, a system that is only private, a system that is uh, not just private in, in terms of private schools, but the emphasis education is left only to parents 
is one that uh, can cause uh, market failures. Uh, especially in today's economy where families or parents uh, at home, there's 43% of them, or 45%, sorry, in 2010 had two working parents in the home. And uh, only 28.7% had, had a stay-at-home parent, uh, and, th and that's compared to 54.6% in 1975. So as you can see, over time, there's uh, because of economic hardships and just the, the nature of our society, more people are having to depend on two working parents to uh, be able to survive. And there's it's difficult to be able to ask those two working parents that one of them has to stay home and teach their kids or that the responsibility for education their kids is on them entirely. And that's not to say that parents don't have responsibility to educate their kids. Parents are our best educators. However, another market failure is that there are some parents who do not wish to, to educate their children at all. And in, in an anarchical system uh, where there is no uh, government regulation of education or government involvement, uh, limited involvement, uh, children will fall by the wayside. And the reason for the public system when it came about was not only to stop uh, youth crime among uh, you know, the youth, but to also um, educate kids and you know, get them off the farms and working into schools so that they can then better themselves in the future. Um, you know, when we're more in an agrarian society, the parents want their kids at home working. So they didn't invest in their education. Uh, those are just a few of the different market failures that happen in a, in a system where there is no structure or there is no some sort of uh, government presence to help regulate it in a limited scale. Uh, but I am a firm believer that market solutions are the answer. Specifically, uh, I believe in um, I believe conservatives believe in school choice, uh, an idea first heralded by Milton Friedman. Secondly. Uh, I believe an idea of uh, in pushing school, uh, sorry, not school choice, but um, uh, school vouchers specifically in relating to school choice to as a way of government involving itself and bringing more market-based solutions to the table. Uh, and because market failures are real, uh, the involvement of government um, at a minimum as an observatory role is essential to ensure that our children um, are educated in a way which they are able to exercise their free liberty. Um, and one of the main problems that I think that conservatives would agree with that is a problem with our education system is the involvement of public sector unions and, and uh, private unions, specifically the CTA um, in California and other teacher unions that have uh, weighed down on schools in a way of which they are unable to uh, experiment with different education, education. models. 30 seconds. And they are unable to uh, fire bad teachers, um, different things like that where these are not necessarily um, causes of the government and the, all the government sanctions unions. They are externalities that can be dealt with in a way of not entirely removing government's presence while improving the education system um, overall. And I yield the remainder of my time. And time. That was the end of the first round from Seth Morrison for his opening statement. And now a word from our first sponsor. So for all you pet owners looking for rentals, let me introduce Cordomi Rentals out of Fast Art Studio. They find apartments and rental homes with pet policies that fit whatever pet or breed of animal you have. So for all you pet lovers looking for a furry home or a place for your furry friends, please check out Cordomi Rentals. So up next... We have the first round from Eric Hennigan coming up. And Eric, I'll let you know when you are on. And Eric, you are on. Uh, well, <laughs> being an anarchist, I actually completely agree already with Seth. So the only thing that it seems that we're going to have any debate about is what is the best way to argue for school choice. Because I'm a firm believer in school choice. I'm actually a firm believer in choice for everybody. And school's just a particular instance of that. Uh, I've heard a lot of critics of the private education market come up with certain arguments and we might want to address those. 
So one of them is that uneducated people couldn't recognize a good school from a bad one. And I just don't believe that's true, but I'll let Seth deal with it if he wants. Um, there's also a good one that the poor wouldn't be able to afford education. And I definitely don't believe that's true because James Tooley, uh, author of The Beautiful Tree, has gone into India and China and some of the poorest of the poor neighborhoods in the entire world, and he has found a workable system of private education. And, and this is a system where some of the kids and their parents have the ability to go to a public school, but they actually choose a private one instead. And it, the, the, they're, a lot of them are unregulated, too. So the, the bureaucracies in place in those areas just didn't even know these schools existed. And, and because they didn't know the schools existed, they assumed that all the children were completely uneducated. Which, which is a, a terrible false assumption on the part of the government officials in those areas. Another uh, critic is that, for example, if we had a, a completely privatized school system, uh, I imagine that a lot of people would be homeschooling. And I've heard that they don't get any socialization skills, which really just bothers me because I think about the socialization skills that I got in school and I don't think that a three-year-old needs to learn to live in a world only of three-year-olds because the real world isn't like that. And I don't think that teenagers should live in a world that consists solely of other teenagers because the real world isn't like that. That, that is, I, I think if you want the skills and the tools to get along in society, you should actually be part of that society. And you shouldn't get locked away and separated into a, a government schooling system. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting that, that Seth picked up on the market failure aspect. I, I wasn't going to uh, consider using that one, but it, it is true that it's, it's really difficult to put the responsibility of education onto the back of two working parents. But there are a number of free market uh, mechanisms that can be used to help alleviate that cost. And maybe you don't need two working parents if the government wasn't taxing your house so harshly in order to pay for the school. That is, because government has a tendency to have a large bureaucratic process that's very costly to run, it's quite possible that privatized schools are on the whole cheaper. It's just they don't look it when they have to compete with government schools as the only other option. Because government school appears free, only because the cost, costs are, are hidden from you. But if you got that money back in your pocket, say, through a voucher system, and that allowed you to choose other schools, then I think we could see a, a really, really good positive change. I'm personally not in favor of the voucher system because I think it's a halfway measure. But a halfway measure is a step in the right direction. I, I just would like to go all the way there in one leap and bound just a completely privatized market entirely. And I, I do have to cite um, James, or John Taylor Gatto, the author of Underground History of American Education, American Education. 30 seconds. and several other books. And he goes through those books and he analyzes the formation of the American Education Institution uh, as a government institution and finds out that it's completely reprehensible. The people involved in creating it wanted to exercise control over society. And I'll, I'll yield the remainder of the time. And time. So that was the end of the first opening statement from Eric Hennigan. Please remember, if you have any questions for the Q&A session at the end, please leave them on the Google Hangouts page, so me, the moderator, could ask them to either or both our contestants. Now a word from our second sponsor. So for all you medical technology advocates in the audience, please check out sonovalife.com. So using your own stem cells extracted from your own adipose tissue, or we call that fat, they take your own stem cells and inject them wherever you have arthritis or a, or a tear. 
So led by John Chi, this is the new innovation of regenerative medical devices. So up next, round number two from Seth Morrison. Seth, I'll let you know right when you're on. And Seth, you are on. Well, I'm glad we agree on so much. I think uh, there's a few things that we do disagree on. Um, and one of them, uh, he mentioned there at the end, it was his preference to go uh, to a fully privatized system in one leap. I think one of the problems with that is that we've had gener generations of social socialization by public schools, and I think that uh, parents um, today and future parents, uh, people in our generation who are now just having kids, uh, it would be such a culture shock for them that uh, even Milton Friedman uh, advocated that we do it in steps. Um, I specifically think that a good half step or, or a good step in the right direction is uh, charter schools. Charter schools are a great way to uh, diminish the influence of unions and schools and also offers uh, different ways for children to learn. Uh, recently there was a TED talk about uh, which, a, which a kid gave and he called his school or the way that he learned uh, school hacking, uh, if I have that right. And basically he learned in his own pace. It, it, was a, it was a form of homeschooling which if he was interested in you know, the outdoors, he went outdoors. Uh, if he wanted to go learn about uh, firefighters, he went and went to a firehouse. I think there's a lot of ways uh, in which we can uh, modify our current education system to make it better. Now, one of the main differences I think between me and Eric is that I think he would he would see that no government money is involved in education. And while I, I have strong tendencies toward that, and and you know I might even consider that idea, I think it's it's unrealistic that it would ever happen. Even if we lived in uh, a more libertarian society, even if the Republicans were in, in power for a hundred years, I think people like having the government involved in education. Um, I recently heard about uh, a study where they where a school was, was very liberal and uh, they, they thought that they were going to be more freeing and so, so they took up all the fences um, and so, you know, the kids would feel more free, so there were no fences. And what they found was that the kids, <clears throat> they all huddled together towards the middle. And when they had fences, they were all out by the fences. I think what the fences symbolizes is the government's uh, light touch in the area, area of education. Because if we don't have any sort of uh, standards, um, and standards can only be set universally by the government, if there aren't any standards, then we have different levels of education, and, and some kids might be going to cheap uh, private schools but getting uh, a subpar education. Uh, I, would, I would like to see uh, private schools on uh, more prominent than public schools but again I, I do not think that there, I, I think there's a significant part of the population who simply do not care. Um, they, you know, they love their kids, they value their kids but they are more pressing things, they're, they're two jobs that they're working than to think about necessarily uh, where's the best school? Or maybe, maybe they do think about it, but they're stuck in where they are, and so the only schools available to them are the lesser schools, and they don't want to move or send their kids farther off. And so I think the way that government's involvement is beneficial to that is that by providing government funds and government standards in some areas, at least, a, at least setting a floor, it allows for a structure around the entire ed education system that uh, creates a, a more clear way for parents to uh, rate how their kids doing are they succeeding at this you know privatized school um, and for also to parents to have assurance that you know it's hard making a budget and and the the tax uh, you know the the taxes that you would need to get back from the government to justify or to be able to allow you to budget for paying for a private school even if the costs do go down because of deregulation uh, I, I have a hard time thinking that it would be enough to cover the cost of school. Uh, you know, there's there's that large percentage of people that don't even pay uh, income tax, and so what taxes are they going to get back that would then be in their pockets for them to budget for school? So it's it's hard for me to to, to make that connection, um, and without the government's involvement in that area of providing vouchers uh, to those low income uh, parents, those low income households for them to be able to allocate, allocate money. 30 seconds. Schools. Um, but like, like I said earlier, I think there's a lot of common ground here. I think specifically on the idea that 
government's uh, overbearing hand in education does lead to problems, and I think we've seen that all across the country where schools are dilapidated and falling apart, and that's because of too strong, strong of a hand of government, and too strong a hand of uh, public sector unions, specifically teacher unions. And time. And that was the end of the second round from Seth Morrison. And now a word from our next feature company out of the Fast Start Studio Incubator. So quick dial. So if you are tired of Googling different businesses to kind of do research on, check out Quick Dial. One text or video voice recording sends out to local businesses within a certain radius who respond to you on how they could accommodate your needs. So no more finding businesses around through Google. Just one text, one voice call, and they'll go to you. So coming up next, round two from Eric Hennigan. Be sure to put any questions or votes on who you thought had a better argument or better debate on the Google Hangouts page. Here we go. And Eric, you are on. So uh, Seth pointed out that even with a lack of regulation, it might still be the case that schooling is unaffordable. Uh, James Tooley in The Beautiful Tree, when he was going around India and uh, some parts of Africa and China and these very poor neighborhoods, where uh, the majority of families in those neighborhoods were living on $30 a month, these parents still cared very much about their children's education, and they went so far as to find many, many schools in the local area that, that, that were quite dilapidated, admittedly, but then the whole neighborhood's really poor, and they were willing to spend up to 10% of their salary on their child's education. And that's in addition to the fact that in some of these cases, government was still taxing them for a public school in the area. But the private schools uh, universally had more dedicated teachers, and they even gave away up to 30% of the seats uh, to the poorest of the poor, those that really couldn't afford it. So, so even though the, the free market school uh, paid its teachers less and expected them to show up on time, it, it was still the case that, that they were much more dedicated. Uh, they thought they were making a difference in the world. That made them very happy. They had a lot of a lot more uh, participation with parents, and so the parents knew that what they were getting and why they were getting it, and they knew that at any time they could pull their child out and try and go to a different school. So they gossiped with each other about which school was best in the area, and g given that level of involvement, it really worked out, and. Even though they're really, really poor, uh, the, the parents all recognized that, that they wanted their children to, a lot of them, learn English, because they thought English was the, the thing of the future in the global economy. And the government school just wasn't providing that. So, so they jumped ship. They went to a private market. It was completely unregulated. Uh, in a lot of cases, if a regulator drops by, you slip him ten dollars and he disappears and doesn't report that your school exists anymore. So for, for, for the parents in the area, a, a really light regulatory hand enabled them to, to have and create more choices for themselves. And, and the, I think that's worked out wonderfully. And we should take that lesson, because if it works for the poorest of the poor in the world, it's got to work for the rich guys like us. I mean, why not? Um, one thing that Seth did object to is, is that if we had a completely free privatized market, there would not be any guaranteed minimum level of education for every person. And I think even with, with the most fascistic school system, you still don't actually guarantee that everybody gets the same minimum level of education. So some people are going to slip through the cracks in every single system. And I would rather see the people who care be able to run and sprint instead of holding everybody back at a snail's pace that the government school does. One pace fits all. I, I just don't think that that's true. 
I, I think the private market can provide a lot more flexibility for individual learning styles and aptitudes and, and interests. Um, and, and I think it's perfectly okay that the people in the world, in the society that I live in, have different levels of education or that their educational background focused on different things because I just see that as a social asset of diversity. That is, it doesn't threaten me to think that a, a bunch of people might be poor. I'm still going to invest in education because I recognize that by doing so, I get the primary benefit because the result of education is stuff in my head. It's not stuff in their head. And long be be before the government school system existed in America, there was a long history of a social expectation that if you wanted to make your life better, you were the one that was supposed to do that. There, there wasn't going to be somebody that was going to give you a, a handout or anything like that. And so people individually, they focused on their own education and their own self-improvement much more than, than people do today where it's taken out of our hands. Time! And that was the end of the second round for Eric Hennigan. So please remember, if you have any questions for either of the contestants at the end of the structured rounds, please put them on the Google Hangouts page. Also, don't forget to vote for whoever, whichever contestant has the better argument, ideas, or thoughts on the topic tonight. And now, our next featured company, Click It Notes. So I love to learn, but I hate to read. So Click It Notes helps you annotate, dictate, or take notes over whatever audiobook, videos, and media so you never have to lose your moments of brilliance. So led by Dylan Watkins, please check out ClickItNotes.com to become a beta user for this new and upcoming technology. Here we go. Up next for round number three, is Seth Morris. And Seth, I'll let you know right when you're up. And you are on. So my question, my question is, is, what level of education are those kids in those poor neighborhoods actually receiving? Uh, they arguably value education more than, than we do now. Uh, because we've been socialized and feel entitled to our education. Now, just because they value education more doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting a better education. Yeah, you, you mentioned that they're still in a poor neighborhood, it's an unregulated area, uh, you know, there's, there, is, there are reasons why you know, the, these developing nations are developing. And I actually think that if, if, you went to, if you were to go back when our nation was developing and uh, when our nation's education system was developing, I'm sure you'd find similar stories of you know local groups coming together and uh, you know having the education outside of what the government was enforcing. But I think the reason why that largely went away, besides government involvement, was because it was hard to guarantee uh, a level of uh, a standard of which was acceptable to you know. The, the general population or the people within that uh, small community. Now, I, he, he, Eric made a good point that just because you have standards doesn't mean that everybody meets them, and I think that's that's easily seen uh, in our uh, our our inner city schools now. I think that it's a travesty, um, and I do think market-based solutions will lead to uh, a better a better outcome for a lot of students. Um, and the real travesty is that gifted students in our public school system are not uh, given the tools and able to advance. Uh, they are held back. AP classes, even, them, even themselves, aren't, they don't do enough um, to allow these gifted students who maybe they're gifted and, and you know, they, they could be either just smarter or they could just be learning a different way that allows them to learn at a higher rate. But if they, if they only learn the same way every time, we can't guarantee their success. And I just want to make one last point, then I'll, I'll yield the re remainder of my time, is that people do not think on a societal level. So it's hard to, to tell them, oh, you know, we need to all donate towards education uh, freely because, uh, you know, it's good for the society. society. The only way we get, get away with it when they do make the argument for higher taxes is that you don't see the money before the taxes are taken out. So it's easier 
to say yes to that than it is to actually write a check. And I, I think we see that uh, in our public schools today in that, you know, uh, public schools are really expensive and then they do have large endowments, but, uh, you know, the, the number of uh, poor students that they do um, give scholarships to is, is nowhere near where we'd like to see them. And a part of that is because of a lack of government funding. Um, and the reason why I make that point is because it would be so difficult because we've been, we're entitled to our education now, it'd be so difficult to um, enforce that on our, our people. And I have to yield the remainder of my time. I'll be back in one second. And time. And that was the end of the third round for Seth Morrison. Coming up next is Eric Hennigan with his opener for the third round. And for the next plug-in for the companies, if you think you have what it takes to be a startup entrepreneur and if you have a bright idea, please visit FastStartStudio.com. All the greatest minds in Southern California making new and upcoming companies in tech, medicine, products, you name it. So check out FastStartStudio.com for all you future entrepreneurs. Coming up, the third round for Eric Hennigan. Eric, I'll let you know when you're up. And Eric, you are on. So I'm, I'm going to answer a couple of questions really quickly, and then I'll yield the remainder of our, my time so that we can do the open question and answer period. It's probably a lot more interesting. Um, Seth directly asked me about whether these children are getting a substandard education, and I would say compared to what's available in our market in the U.S., definitely yes, but compared to what's available in the market in which they live, I would say no, because these parents have opted not to go to a government school because in the government school, officials don't show up or the teachers don't show up because they live uh, rather far away and the bus doesn't enable them to get to the school until this day is half over, or they're asleep at their desk, or um, a, a large number of other issues where, where they're just not being effective teachers. And because they're in the government system, the, the parents aren't able to fire the teachers, so they just went to a private school instead. So they're definitely not getting a substandard education in the market in which uh, they have options. Uh, the other question I'd like to address is, uh, I, I can't see it in my notes, but the, then I'll just point out that uh, Milton Friedman is the one who is re responsible for the withholding system of our taxes that ends up making it a lot easier to pay the cost or because it makes the cost not so visible. So yes, he advocates uh, the voucher system, but he's also responsible for this horrible mechanism that allows the current system to stay in place. So I'll yield my re the remainder of my time in order for the open question and answer period to be extended. And time. So that was the end of the third round for Eric Hennigan. We actually have two more rounds for each person for the structured debate before we head into the open mic and Q&A. So up next is Seth Morrison for the fourth, his fourth and final round of the structured debate. And then we'll go for one final round with Eric Hennigan, then for the 10-minute open mic and the 10-minute Q&A. Please remember to vote for whoever contestant you think has the better argument, ideas, or thoughts. And please leave your questions on the Google Hangout page for me, the moderator, to ask him in the final 10-minute Q&A section with the audience. And coming up is Seth. And Seth, you are on. It's actually it's funny, actually I, I didn't know that about Milton Friedman, and uh, now that I know that, uh, I have a little bit different opinion of him. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, there's there's one thing that I think has been the, uh, the, the common theme here, is that what works for 
maybe a developing society, uh, which I would agree, I, I, I believe you wholeheartedly that they are probably getting a better education than they are uh, from their government. But what I think the difference is, is that our society is at a certain point of which I don't necessarily think that that would always be the case. Um, I, I'm a wholehearted believer in, uh, in homeschooling and in charter schools and in, in private schools and all that, but I do think that there's a reason why it's so hard to get uh, vouchers passed and to get uh, educational reform passed is because as a society we are stuck in our ways of public schooling. I think there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, pleasant feelings towards it. You know, all the all the media is in favor of you know the high school team and all that stuff. And I think those are those are great things that um, you know the, the high school football team, the dances and all that are great. Uh, however, I do think it makes it harder for vouchers to be put in place when the teacher unions can go and say, look, they're going to take all these things that you love um, and throw them away for in favor of a foreign system that you might not understand. So I think a good half step into a more market-based solution uh, is maintaining government's involvement in education. Uh, and again, I think because people are comfortable with it, and I think that, you know, any way that, that we can bring more market solutions into what's currently existing, uh, the better and the more people will uh, accept it. I think that's the key point is what people will accept. And I don't think people will accept a fully privatized education system, but what they will accept is modifications to our education system which bring more market-based solutions. I think they, they make sense. And if you look in places like in Washington, D.C., or in Indiana, or in Louisiana, where uh, voucher systems have been put in place, uh, they're working great, and they uh, they benefit the poorest of the poor and the ethnic minorities, um, and allow them to go to schools of their choice. Uh, but again, it really comes down to what will people accept. And a, a education system without government in it, I don't think people will accept. So I'll go ahead and yield the remainder of my time. And time. And that was the end of the fourth round for Seth Morrison. Up next, the last of the structured rounds coming up by Eric Hennigan before we head into the 10-minute open mic Q&A and the audience Q&A afterwards. So here we go. Please remember to vote and leave your questions on the Google Hangouts page for me to ask either contestant at the end. And Eric, you are on. Well, well Seth's uh, uh, certainly correct about um, me taking a very hard position or to argue for by by advocating a a complete severance of government involvement and a leap directly to a fully privatized system, and that does make a lot of people very very uncomfortable. Uh, in it, if, if certain areas adopt a voucher system because it is more palatable to, palatable to them then and, and the voucher system shows success because a half market is definitely better than no market, then I think that we can both leverage uh, that success in order to argue for the, an increase in choice yet again. So. So it's certainly possible that we could take the, the voucher system and the successes that it has and push them forward after people are comfortable in that system. Now, as far as um, what are people generally willing to accept uh, as possibilities, I, I can only think that they feel uncomfortable not having an authoritarian presence because they were raised within a government school. And John Taylor Gatto has this wonderful article that was written a uh, rather long time ago called The Sixth Lesson School Teacher. And he talks about his experience in the education system as uh, one of New York City's uh, most honored public school teachers of all time. He noted that one of the things that he was teaching is he was teaching kids to stay in class where they belong. That is, they're not allowed to roam free. They, they just have to stay put where they're told. That they should turn their attention on and off like a light switch. So none of the classes ever got through all the material, and they would always abandon the topic at hand as soon as the recess bell 
uh, went off. That, that is, how can you expect people to get um, any kind of good education if the moment things start getting get interesting, they have to abandon the lesson and go to recess? Uh, he, his, the third lesson was that the children must surrender their will to a predestined chain of command, and that would be the uh, authoritarian system of the teacher and the principal and, and all of that stuff. The children weren't really allowed to do whatever they wanted to do. The, uh, whatever actions they took, if, if the parents in charge didn't like it, then they suffered severe consequences. They had to stay where they belonged. Uh, so lesson number four was that others determine your curriculum. You don't get to choose what you study. The teacher chooses what, what you study. And it's actually not even the teacher who chooses, it's some school board that chooses. And the, the fifth lesson is that self-respect should depend on an observer's measure of your worth, which, which is morally uh, foul, because it just leads, leads to broken people. There's, if, if you're raised in a system where you have to keep other people happy, how can you hope to keep yourself happy? It's, it's just not going to happen, because there's no way you can please everybody all the time. Um, I, I, I would like to get back to the topic a little bit on, on the homeschooler issue and the free market issue about being a little bit unregulated. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm completely comfortable with that, but a lot of people are unsettled by it and they'd like to have some kind of minimum standard of education set and met. I've noticed, though, that the people who take education into their own hands have done by far the best. Uh, there's a guy, he has uh, this web page called the MIT Challenge, where he went through the four-year computer science curriculum at MIT by using their online open courseware. So he rated himself on all the tests and did all the homework in his spare time after work. And he went through their four-year curriculum in one year and, and wrote a blog page about it. As an employer, I am much more impressed with that blog page and the questions he can answer as a result of that effort than I am by Body. a four-year a, a four degree-holding MIT student. And I did read another article recently in the news about homeschoolers evaluating university versus the economic costs. They look at it differently. They think, why should I go in that much debt when I can get a job and start earning money today and build the skills today at the job that I go to? Build my curriculum and my career. So it, it's looking like education is not, or higher education is Time. not. And that was the end of the structured rounds between Eric Hannigan and Seth Morrison. Now we're going to lead into the 10-minute open mic where both contestants can cross-examine each other and see who has the best resolution to the conflict or the holes in the education system and government's involvement in it. Right now I'm going to unmute both contestants so they can both openly speak. And this is going to go on for 10 minutes unless either or both have nothing else to say openly to each other, then we're going to go into the Q&A with the audience. And gentlemen, both your mics are unmuted, and you may uh, cross-examine each other accordingly. Well, let me just, let me ask, just ask an opening open question. question. First, uh, uh, do you do believe that school should be mandatory? mandatory? No. No. <laughs> I, I, I don't think the school should be mandatory, and I think that if you have such a system, it's equivalent to kidnapping. So yeah, in that structure, then, where school's not mandatory, then you are accepting of the market failures of, of parents, you know, say, who live, who are in a, you know, the more rural areas and rather have their kids working on the farms as opposed to getting education, uh, you would be okay with that. I, I'm completely okay with that. Uh, the, that is, I consider the cost there to be less than the cost of a single bureaucratic system that holds uh, star students back and can't even maintain a good level of reading age for the general populace. I also think that the government education system uh, has a lot of propaganda, and so I'd rather have a diverse set of propaganda instituted by parents 
rather than a single set of propaganda done by government. Well, I mean, I, I would agree with you on some of those points, but I think one of the things that, you know, I brought up is that uh, I think that, or I guess a question to you, another question is, do you think that uh, in order to effectively exercise one's liberty, which I'm assuming you hold a high above everything else, they need a modicum of education and a, a, a basis of which that we all have a similar understanding where they can we can say reasonably that they are making reasonable decisions or rational choices um, and do you believe that education has a has a role to play in giving people that ability to exercise the liberty effectively I I think education does but I don't think the government school is the way of achieving that there is I've noticed in government school a lot of uh, personal choice is removed. So uh, you, you, you brought up an example of, of the TED Talk where the kid had the charter school and he had a much more self-directed education system. And I think if more people had more self-direction that we would be able to talk to each other a lot easier. We wouldn't have the problem that we're unable to communicate. But if, you, if, school, if some sort of schooling is not mandatory, then how can you guarantee that that person is going to be able to achieve a certain basic knowledge, basic education, to be able to exercise their liberty? So if, if someone, all, all they do is they work on a farm all day, they may know, they may know farm stuff, but you know, well, then we ask them to vote, and they don't know anything about the government, they don't know anything about how, how our system works at all, uh, how can we then say that they are exercising their liberty in a rational manner? Well, I, I'm, I'm not about to impose upon other people to spend their lives in a chair for any, any period of time. I'm, I'm just completely unwilling to do that. Um, but it, it, sh it should be rather self-evident. Like I said, before the American uh, government took hold of the education system, it was a widespread acknowledged belief that if you wanted to do better in your life, you would self-educate. And I have reason to believe that that would just be the commonly held idea again. And, and so even though people might be lazy and not do it, they would still recognize that they ought to. You know, and I, I think I would agree with that point. I, I, you, know, you can look back and see that you know, it's not that everybody in the past, when before there was a government education, weren't educated. I, I don't think, I'm not arguing that. What I am arguing is that... Uh, the benefits of a public education system is that more people are educated than before we had a public education system. I mean, you, I think the argument could be made that there was maybe a better education system before for the people that were utilizing it. But I think you have to also recognize that less people were being educated. And I think it's, it's a, there's a net gain for the... And I understand that it's not... net. Whether the education system is good or bad, I don't think. I think you would you would say that doesn't matter. It's it's imposing something on someone else. However, I think by not allow by not giving some a child, you know, uh, by not giving them the an education, you know, because their parents rule their life, um, but not allowing them to have an education, you are also imposing another thing on them and imposing a. Uh, uh, an existence in which it depends on their parents that will really shape their, you know, perception of liberty and their ex exercising of that liberty. So, I mean, do you see the conflict there? That I think that either way you're imposing on someone, which one's the better? Well, I, I'm not imposing on somebody that they have to educate themselves, but I, I might be removing them or removing from them the offer of a quote-unquote free system of education. And it's only free in appearance, it's not actually sure. free in cost. Yeah. Um, but for, for any, say, radical fundamentalist authoritarian parents that lock their kids in a cage and force books down their mind, there's also going to be a, a majority of parents that, that think that's not really the way to do it, and they're going to find a charter school, or they're going to find a homeschool group, and they're going to share ideas, and they're, they're going to get a lot more benefit 
out of the personal involvement in education. So I, I think on the whole it's going to be beneficial even though some people might might end up getting the short straw a little bit. And I, I don't think that today's government school system provides any benefit if John Taylor's six lessons of school are about following orders given to you by somebody else and not thinking for yourself. I, I think that's actually a, a vast and huge um, hard to account for cost. No, I, I would agree. I mean, I think there are, are real and significant problems with our education system, specifically the standards set forth now in Common Core by the federal government. Um, but I, I, I do think that there is a large portion of the population that would choose public school, would choose to have government run their education. And because of that, I don't, and while I may want the, the education to be, you know, completely free of government involvement, regulation, I don't think it's ever going to happen. So, I mean, I guess my thing is, is would you, I mean, would you, I mean, I've, already, I've talked to people who, who are anarchists and, and, and they've said, you know, I would, even if it's never going to happen, I'm still going to stand on this, on this soapbox, would you say that you would be willing to support, you know, these half measures, even in your eyes, to get to, you know, to be better in your eyes, but not reach the final goal. Well, I, I'm I'm still going to stand on the soapbox because I believe that by by taking an extreme position, I can move the center. Mm. <laughs> but um, I, in in so far as would I support a charter system or a voucher system as a half half measure? Yes, I would, because it's still moving in the correct direction. Two minutes, gentlemen. Well, I, well, I, I see that as definitely, definitely more open approach than, than I've encountered before. I've, I've, enc I think what happens a lot in these discussions is that coalitions can't be built around education because there's there's different groups who only want one outcome. And you know, what what I see is as the most effective way is, is gauging what we as a society will accept and go towards that. And I think we will accept those measures that, that we've talked about and we both agree on. Um, I, I just I don't see it getting that far of where we don't have government involvement. I mean, government is so huge now. I mean, it would take 100 years to get there, for, you know, how slow things move. Well, so with the, one thing I notice is that it's not the kids that make the choice. It's the parents that make the choice for the kids. Yeah. And if all the parents went through a government school system, of course that's what they're going yep. to favor. Yep. So it, it, it's by virtue of their lack of imagination of other alternatives that were not part of the government curriculum, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. That, that they would not support an alternative system and a halfway measure seems a lot more palatable. And, and if that is the audience that I have to pander to, then I would hope that their kids, having been given more choice, then have more opportunities available to give their children. 30 seconds. I just have one, one last statement. I think that, and the, I mean, you could answer this, maybe it may will come up, but I think that one, re one other reason why there's a drawback to it is that we have a culture now that surrounds uh, public schools, a culture of, of football games, of dances, things like that. I mean, I went through public high school, had private elementary school, uh, but there is a significant American feeling to a public school. It's very American. And, and I think that's time, time, time. And that was the end of the cross examination 10 minute round between Eric Hennigan and Seth Morrison. If you have any questions for me personally, please email me at Michelle at hashoutbout.com. That's M-I-C-H-E-L at hashoutbout.com. The email you see below. If you want to be on the show or know anybody credible who would like to be on the program, please email me as well. If there's a certain topic you'd like to request for me to find two credible contestants to debate upon to come from a conflict to resolution, please email me. Now, before we go into our last 10-minute Q&A from the audience, just wanted to go over the companies we presented today. So out of the Fast Start Studio Incubator, we have Cordomi Rentals. Please check them out at Cordomi Rentals. 
Com. Also, Sonova Life, stem cell research coming at your way. Also, Quick Dial, one text, one voice call, businesses come to you. And of course, never lose your moments of brilliance. Check out Click It Notes, www.clickitnotes.com for beta testers. Also, last but not least, the Fast Start Studio Incubator in Irvine, California. Support your local startup entrepreneur. We're hustling to make the new companies of this world come to fruition. Now here we go. I'm going to ask two questions from the audience that came up. So gentlemen, if you want to write these down or make a mental note of them. First, for the opening five minutes, we have a question from Megan Shacher. Why do you gentlemen think some are opposed to the voucher system. Once again, why do you gentlemen think some are opposed to the voucher system? I'll unmute both of you, and you could both take turns accordingly over each other if you wanted to on answering that question. Once more time, that is, why do you gentlemen think some are opposed to the voucher system? And go ahead. Eric, I'll let you I'll let you gentlemen. I think that people pose it because of uh, union influence. I think that's directly it. Unions stand a lot to lose when vouchers are implemented. It takes away from their power, it takes away from their ability to uh, influence education, um, and then they mobilize. They have mandatory union dues, $1,000 a year from each member, and they have large sums of money, and they're able to, to mobilize their, their teachers, telling them they're going to lose their jobs. And uh, th that's exactly why uh, vouchers fail. And it's because of teacher unions. So I, I'm, uh, I haven't ever s uh, been in a situation where I saw a voucher system being proposed and then argued about in the public sphere and rejected. So. I, I'm just ignorant on on why people would want to oppose that kind of system. You live in California, to, to right? To me, it seems like a good idea. Well, in California, it comes up every once in a while. Uh, I can't remember the last. I think it was 2008. It was up. Uh, at least, at least, uh, I think it might be local um, thing, local measures. But uh, you know, they they vehemently fought it in Indiana. It's only because it's a red state they're able to get it passed, and uh, you could see the Department of Justice is filing lawsuits against uh, the Louisiana voucher system saying that it is uh, in effect racist even though it benefits 80% 80, 80 of people part participate are racial minorities. Um, I, I think it's, it's all about power and it's all about power centralized within unions and uh, I think it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge uh, boon to the Republican Party and to conservatives, libertarians who believe that students should have first-rate education, and and for those uh, Democrat voters who who think that Democrats stand up for education, should really take a look at what their uh, leaders have been doing in regards to education. Do you have any other thoughts? And gentlemen, any other thoughts on that question before we move out on to the next question from the audience? Not I'm ready to move. Okay, next question. Here we go. This is coming from Quinn Royston. So for both contestants, do you think the education system needs a more experiential experiential education versus rather than just going through textbooks strictly? Once again, do either of you think the education system needs to focus more on experiential education rather than just textbooks and gentlemen that is open to both of you for the audience one more time just so we reiterate that do you think the education system needs to focus more on experiential education or stick to the traditional textbooks gentlemen both open to you I, I think, think that the, the traditional, traditional textbooks, textbooks are, are, are rather a way of the past so um, I, I'm a computer programmer, and my field is a little bit different than other fields in that a lot of the people who are practicing professionals learned their trade by themselves at home 
reading online and just practicing code and playing around with it. The reasons why I might have to go to a particular classroom and listen to some guy lecture on that topic doesn't make a lot of sense. Because the lecture can be recorded online. And then I can just watch it at home and go at my own pace. The so MIT Challenge did exactly, exactly that, that and went through a four-year curriculum in one year. Admittedly, it's success, and, and that's and one field that we bring out very effectively. Other fields feel very, very little bit. But, but for, for even you know, systems, systems like uh, uh, education, education and history, history and mathematics and whatnot, and whatnot, where you might actually want to react with a lot of people, I think, I the, think way the way the that the is going to be something where you watch the videos online, online and then you go, go to some meetup group that's local and you talk with uh, your friends and, and other people that are taking an online class with you. So you can get the high bandwidth interaction there. I, I would completely agree. I think, uh, especially nowadays, uh, textbooks are they're not enough. Uh, most students, especially in college, don't even read them. Uh, they may just look at the bold words. I mean, I know I've done that, um, and you can get, and I get A's. Um, but we find out that people are graduating and they don't have skills, especially in, in humanities degrees. Uh, political science is a, is a huge one where if you don't internship, you're not going to get a job. And a lot of these classes don't teach you practical skills. Uh, the ones that are different are, are computer science and uh, some of these more scientific ones are engineering that have, they actually teach you how to do your job, but a lot of these other degrees are just superfluous in that they teach you theory, which I love theory, I love learning about it, but it's not useful to you unless you're going to teach theory to other people. Um, and they don't emphasize enough that internships or actual experience in the job is what employers look for. It may have been in the past, in the 50s and 60s, where if you had a degree that you're just going to get a job right away. But those, those entry-level jobs just do not exist anymore. The jobs where they're, they're looking to you know, invest in your training, they got thousands of other people lined up who have a year or two of experience who want that job. And it's unfortunate that our education system, and I think this is, has a lot to do with the influence of unions and, and the obstructionism of, of, of government in these areas, they're so afraid to deviate outside their box and to give uh, real life experience that they don't uh, invest in that. Now, there, there are cases where schools do recognize that and they do invest in that. And I think the majority of those are found in private schools. Um, so again, it's experience always trumps just knowledge because you can know, uh, you can know the whole dictionary, but if you haven't ever seen what things you know, uh, what things you've read, then you don't know how to actually interact with uh, what you've read. So it's, it's a real travesty that a lot of these degrees, especially the humanities degrees, don't have any practical application outside of being able to uh, cite who said what. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that it's, it's always about experience. So I want to just buttress what uh, Seth is saying. The uh, I'm speaking from the engineering background, and I have a similar viewpoint that theory is good and okay, sure, but theory doesn't make much sense, and it's really hard to learn if you don't have the experience yeah. that it's trying to abstract for you. So, yeah. so going out in the real world, the only way you know how to code is by writing a lot of code and making a lot of mistakes and then learning through the theory and figuring out what you did wrong. That's, it's, that's I, completely I can true. only imagine it's going to work for all fields that way. That's completely true. And I, you know, it's especially in those more technical fields, the hands-on experience is even more important because it's, you know, you can't just walk onto a job as a coder and be like, all right, I'm going to figure this out. You have to actually know the language of the code. Um, whereas in political science, you can almost fake it till you make it. I mean, look at our politicians, politicians these, days. these days. Two minutes. So, yeah. Even for something mundane like um, construction work, which, which is a lot of labor, if, if you don't build houses and, and play around with the structures and see how things interact, see how the materials interact with each other and their strengths and weaknesses, then 
it doesn't matter how many video lectures you've seen or what book you've read. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And I think that that great TED talk, and I, I wish I had the name of it, the kid was talking about school hacking of where he was actually interning for uh, like a, a snowboard shop at like age 11. And I think that that, if our education system w revolved more around that, uh, we'd be in a be far off, far better off place. And you know, we didn't get to finish it, but but you know, I'm gonna pose a question to you, Eric. What do you think about this idea that public schools are part of American culture and that football, uh, you know, and guys, one minute is what is a part, a part of our culture. Hard to get rid of. Um, I saw a lot of that uh, when I was growing up, but I have never identified with it. The, that I've I've been just kind of rather antisocial, and I never liked going to pep rallies. I never went to any of the games. I still don't watch any sports on TV. So I, it, for me, it was all just a waste of hoopla. I think it is that way for a lot of people, but for the majority, I think it's the opposite. The opposite. Thirty seconds. It's a time when you're trying to change the system, system that people, people have, have an emotional affinity to. Um, even myself, I mean, I loved going to football games. I loved the whole atmosphere. And to tell people that they that might potentially change if in a, in a if our education system changed, that's a tough thing. I see no reason why you can't have that kind of stuff outside of the school system. I, I don't think so either, but I think it would be it would look different. I think that's what people are afraid of. Um, okay. uh, which uh, I'm not necessarily afraid of. But I think, but I think people people are. Are. All right, gentlemen, and that is time. That is the end of the discussion slash debate between. Seth Morrison, and Eric Hennigan. Gentlemen, I would like to thank both our contestants for being on, and I hope to ho have you both on again. If you have any questions for the contestants afterwards, please leave them on the YouTube page, the Google Hangout page, or feel free to contact me at michelle at hashoutbout.com, and I'll kindly forward those questions to either contestants with their approval. Also, this actual site for Hash Out Bout is being built at the end of April. Note, this is the fourth test I've had, and in April we will have all the bells and whistles without me having to automate it and time this with my phone. So, for the audience members, thank you for watching. Please, you can still vote on the YouTube page or the Google Hangout page. Thank you, Eric Hennigan and Seth Morrison. We'll have you back on the show again. Also, please vote and check out all the companies that I mentioned within the one minute breaks. From everybody at Fast Start Studio and the emerging companies in Southern California, thank you and good night.